truly wealthy in my mind and what makes, what allows someone to amass that amount of money. Uh, the first question, what makes someone truly wealthy, I think is a combination of not just achievement because it's easy. It's very easy to default to racking up sort of feathers in the cap and more money and obsess on those types of measurables by focusing as an A type personality on achievement, right? Just doing more. Mm -hmm and earning more. Uh, the, the bigger challenge for people who are hardwired that way, and I'm certainly this way, is balancing that with appreciating what you have. And that is a necessary component because if you don't, for instance, if you don't appreciate what you have now, you will never appreciate what you get later. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Tim, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So, you know, you don't really need much of an introduction. It'd be kind of ridiculous because I I would assume that just about every single person listening, unless they've been, you know, in a cave for the last 10 years, probably knows who you are. Uh, So, you know, you've actually been a guest on our show before when we were called Blogcast FM. And this was when a four hour chef came out. And this time I wanted to do a, a sort of dive into parts of your story that have never been told before. And You know, really where I wanted to start is looking back, you know, before high school, uh, you know, before Princeton, all of that into sort of the pivotal moments, you know, growing up that have led you to, you know, where you're at in your journey. Um, So would you be willing to talk about some of that whole experience? Absolutely. Uh, I think there were some early formative experiences that shaped a lot of what I did later and maybe some context that people haven't heard before. Uh, let, let me start at the beginning and I'll let you guide me Perfect. as needed. I don't want to give you some long winded Dr. <laughs> Evil type, uh, life story, but I was born and raised on Eastern Long Island. I was a townie, very proud of the fact, uh, I was very proud of the fact that I was a townie in basically the Hamptons. So it was a very bifurcated have and have not, Uh, environment where you saw a very sharp contrast between locals who mostly worked in the service industry and very wealthy people who'd come out from Manhattan for the weekends or the summer. And that is where I went to elementary school, high school for part of my time. And I was born premature, had a lot of health issues early on, was in the intensive care unit for a very long time, had my blood volume transfused, I think five times because my my left lung collapsed, couldn't oxygenate my my blood properly and still have lung issues to this day for that reason. And that's part of the reason I didn't learn to swim until I was in my 30s, for instance. (laughs) Embarrassing, but true. And I I had a, a few, I suppose, experiences uh, in school, for instance, and in sports that were formative. Uh, the, the first that comes to mind is really being rescued in a way as a runt by being thrown into kid wrestling. So I started wrestling when I was eight or nine years old and it was a great way for my mom to exhaust me. So I wouldn't be a hyperactive mess when I got home, but it was also a way that I could build up my confidence in a sport that was based on weight classes instead of getting my ass thrashed in every other sport since I was small and had a lot of uh, allergies, which, um, made it very embarrassing for me to do the presidential fitness test. If, uh, if you've ever, <laughs> if you can recall those and, uh, the, the wrestling forced me to do a few things. Uh, it forced me to develop a very individualized style of competition because it is, of course the points are tallied as a team, but you're, you are really, um, earning your keep on the map by yourself. Uh, the, the second component of that was the fact that I, I had very short uh, endurance capacity. I was very handicapped in that way because I would overheat. And this is related to thermoregulation and my lung capacity. So just like dogs pant to dissipate heat, humans very much do the same thing. So you're breathing and the surface area of the interior of your lungs has, has a implication for how quickly you can, you can, uh, 
dissipate heat and I was very bad at it. So I had to develop a style that was um, unlike most of the people I trained with. And I, I really had to, is particularly once I became very serious in high school and was competing on a national level at one point, develop a style that, that, uh, that compensated for my weaknesses and capitalized on my strengths. And this, a component of that was cutting weight. I had to get very good or one of the few advantages I had was I sweat very easily because of this poor thermoregulation, which meant I could cut water weight very dramatically in short periods of time. So I became very good and I had to study how this, this is how my self tracking developed. I had to study how the kidneys worked, how sodium retention worked, how potassium sparing diuretics worked. And I didn't use anything illegal at the time. Uh, I was just getting a very astute understanding of uh, of how water is retained or expelled and, and optimizing that for losing, say, you know, 15 to 25 pounds in a 24 hour period in some cases, which is very dangerous. And I don't recommend anyone do it, but that is a part of wrestling. And I would do that and rehydrate and say anywhere from, you know, six to 10 hours. And then w- crush my opponents. <laughs> uh, needless to say, and that, that didn't scale perfectly to the highest levels because uh, when you get to increasingly competitive arenas, the, the arsenal that people are familiar with is, is very broad. So when you get to the nationals, everyone is cutting a ridiculous amount of weight. So that no longer becomes a huge unfair advantage. But, uh, I think that those experiences in wrestling and also a handful of the coaches I had now that I think about it, you know, we were, you and I have chatted before about sort of the making the impossible possible. And uh, I had coaches, one in particular, um, Mr. Buxton, who, by the way, almost all of the people from that wrestling team, just my class, you know, my set of classes in high school who trained under Mr. Buxton went on to do really incredible things later in life professionally, almost all of them, uh, including my wrestling partner who went on to found donors uh-huh. uh, which is a massively, uh, successful, the non education nonprofit, you know, endorsed by Michelle Obama and Oprah and so on. But Mr. Buxton would push us beyond the point we thought was humanly possible in each of our cases. And, um, if I was exhausted, had to puke, he'd be like, there's the bucket for puking. You have more in you go get that done and come back. And it was just like, Oh my God. You know? <laughs> so well past the point that any one of us would have tapped out given up, called it quits, looked at ourselves as, as failures. He would push us through that uh, sort of valley of, of death to the opposite side where we would come out stronger with more confidence, believing that uh, we, could, we, could, we could really do the impossible or what we had previously defined as impossible. So those are a few things that come to mind right off the bat as, as having a huge impact on everything that came afterwards. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, and this is where I want to start, you know, having grown up with that stark contrast of have and have nots and you yourself now, you know, having been exposed to wealth and, and accumulated a significant amount of wealth. I mean, how did that sh- shape and, you know, change your view around wealth and money? That's a big one. Uh, it's a good question. I uh, haven't really thought of it. I would say a few, a few things. The first is that when I was growing up and working in the summers as a busboy, typically, I noticed a huge difference between uh, three classes of rich people. Number one, you had the old money. So people who had had millions, tens of millions, billions of dollars for decades. Uh, and those people were fine. They were actually very well behaved and polite for the most part because they were over the fact that they had money. Does that make sense? They, yeah. they, they, it, would, it would be poor taste for them to flaunt it in a really obnoxious way. And uh, so I think in, in, in that respect, they'd integrated money or wealth into an appropriate place and context in their lives. Those people were fine. The, the married, the people who married into those families, not always the case. Um, (laughs) there were some real nuisances. I mean, really entitled sort of like duchesses of fill in the blank Uh, who would have a 10 person dinner with like 20 kids crying and screaming, throwing bread around and then not tip at all. I mean, it was really egregiously bad behavior, but generally speaking, old money was fine. Then you had the 
self-made people. And uh, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard this is a, a pretty, uh, or this is not everyone's experience with self-made folks, but uh, I ended up having the opportunity to, to bus for Billy Joel uh, one day. And he was so gracious to me. And I answered a, a bunch of you know, kind of silly questions because I felt like I had to ask him questions. It was my one once in a lifetime opportunity to talk to a celebrity. But he was, he was really just a pleasant guy to interact with. He was not rushed or abrasive and I could have just caught him on a bad day. Who knows? But he tipped me $20 for a cup of coffee and that just had such a humongous, uh, it made such a humongous impression on me. The, the contrast between say that and the last class, which was sort of the nouveau riche waving dollars in your face, um, using money as a status symbol to put themselves above other people. Very oftentimes the locals where they'll just like pull up in a Mercedes and park in a handicapped spot and be like, yeah, fuck you. If you give them any shit, uh, sue me, you know, and you're just like, what really? Like, well, and that's usually when the kids, um, would tear off their hood ornaments. <laughs> Collecting hood ornaments from people like that was kind of a sport uh, among a lot of my friends. <laughs> and, you know, even at this point, I have no sympathy for those folks. Um, so, um, but it has been challenging for me to reconcile going home and basically being a city person. We would always call them, you know, the city people. Oh, those goddamn city people. And, <laughs> and now, the, the fact of the matter is I have more friends in New York City than I do perhaps in my hometown. And I, I still have friends I grew up with. And I, it's not like I've abandoned those people. I'm, I, you know, I was just texting with one of my childhood friends today who still lives out there. But it's been challenging for me to figure out where I kind of fit. And what I've concluded is maybe it's not important for me to conclude where I fit. It's not important for me to find the appropriate category. I'm just somewhere in between. And that's fine. It's okay. Um, I see both sides of uh, a lot of the arguments. But I still tend to, of course, fall on the side of the locals where it's like, look, I got Lyme disease last summer and I was decimated for, have been still uh, dealing with a lot of health problems. And part of the reason there's so much Lyme disease is that there's a massive overpopulation of deer, including many sick deer and older deer uh, who should be culled. And the proposal to have sharpshooters come in and thin the herd for health reasons was uh, vetoed by city people who vacation out there aren't there full time and don't want to see Bambi get shot. And it's like, well, that's great that you have this romantic association with these disease vectors, these, uh, you know, tick carrying, um, large mice with hooves, but, uh, you are using your sophisticated sort of, uh, politicking abilities coming out of the city where that's more highly valued to cause big problems for locals. And I, I still think that's bullshit, but, uh, going off on perhaps a tangent, but <laughs> I, I, I bounce it back and forth between, um, empathy for both sides. And so that, that's been challenging. Interesting. So let me ask you this, you know, just listening to you talk about that. One of the questions that came up for me as I was thinking it through it and hearing what you're saying is, you know, how has all of that affected, you know, sort of the social dynamics and relationship building that you do with, you know, sort of the influential and, and wealthy people that you interact with. And also, one of the questions that I've asked so many people here, uh, who've accumulated wealth is what is it that separates sort of, you know, these people who are wealthy from a mindset perspective from the ones who struggle? Let's see, let me answer the first question first. So the first question, the answer to the first question is, I am actually in a process of reducing my network, so to speak, or loose ties that require heavy management. Mm -hmm. Then I am in the process of building my network. And what I've realized, this is another reason why I'm actually cutting down on the number of books I read, is that I want to specialize in not just in case information or just in case relationships, but just in time information and just in time relationships. And uh, the reason for that is there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, 90% less, who knows, uh, decrease in cognitive burden when you approach it that way. Instead of reading like 10 business books in case and highlighting things, in which case you, if, if the information is actually needed, you just need to go back and reread everything. Uh, what if I could establish a network of 
and really when I say that, I mean group of friends because it's a lot less effort to do the hard work on the front end to find world-class performers who you can actually be friends with, uh, including outside interests and personal conversations and so on. Can I, can I have a group of say 10 to 20 people who have access to anyone I would possibly need access to and therefore any information I might need? And that is, rather than having individual relationships with every uh, contingency mm-hmm. uh, resource, right, person or information or otherwise, can I, by the fact that I'm being endorsed or backed by a close friend, get in touch with a friend of theirs who can help me with, say, uh, a medical issue like the Lyme disease, right? Like I, I immediately, even though I didn't know them directly, had access to two or three of the world's top infectious disease specialists. So that's that's how I think about it. And uh, collecting business cards and going about networking in on mass for volume, I think, is a major mistake. And I've I've never taken that approach. Even when I was fresh out of college and really didn't know anybody, I ne- I volunteered at events business events that were put on by uh, sort of startup nonprofits and so on or or for or paid organizations I would volunteer and get to the point where I had more responsibility because I would take on additional responsibilities they didn't ask me to do and that really separates you as a volunteer most volunteers do barely enough just to get by mm. because they feel like they've earned that since they're not getting paid which is a stupid perspective to have. Uh, so I would take on additional responsibility until I was at a point where I could say, interact and help organize panelists and speakers, all of whom were very well known and powerful and successful in their own right. And that is how a nobody gets to know, at least on a very, very minimal personal level to make a good impression on people who are like a thousand pay grades above you. Um, so I took that approach. Um, in terms of money, and wealth. I don't think having a lot of money and being wealthy are the same things. I, I know a lot of people who literally have hundreds of millions of dollars who are very unhappy. Uh-huh. Um, but the, the, so I'll answer your question two ways. So what makes someone truly wealthy in my mind and what makes, what allows someone to amass that amount of money? Uh, the first question what makes someone truly wealthy, I think, is a combination of not just achievement, because it's easy, it's very easy to default to racking up sort of feathers in the cap and more money and obsess on those types of measurables by focusing as an A-type personality on achievement, right? Just doing more mm-hmm. and earning more. Uh, the, the bigger challenge for people who are hardwired that way, and I'm certainly this way, is balancing that with appreciating what you have. And that is a necessary component because if you don't, for instance, if you don't appreciate what you have now, you will never appreciate what you get later. So what is the end goal of all of this achieving, achieving and amassing? Uh, so I, I build in a gratitude practice and journaling in the morning, you know, three things that I'm grateful for and so, so on to make a habit of present state awareness of things that I already have. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that's answer number one. How do you amass or what is the mindset that allows someone to amass that amount of money is, I think, the ability to completely question any type of assumption or best practice in any industry. Nothing is sacred. Uh, they are perfectly happy to turn everything upside down. And uh, whether that's, you know, they say, oh, like you need to be warm and fuzzy as an employee, uh, as, as a boss. Like that's the whole thing these days. It's like, really? Steve Jobs wasn't that way. Henry Ford wasn't <laughs> that way. They were hard asses. And if you're hardwired to be a hard ass, like, look, this is going to be a military organization. And uh, if you don't want to be part of that, that's totally fine. You can, uh, you're opting in by applying for a job, but understand what you're signing up for. Like this is SEAL Team 6. This isn't Teletubbies. Uh, and uh, they, or they might say, it's like, okay, well, people say you have to have an office and do this and raise money in this following way. They're like, screw that, right? Like automatic. They have, they have, they're worth more than a billion dollars. They power WordPress.com and so on. And they have a completely distributed workforce. Hundreds of people spread all over the world. No central, no central office per se. And, uh, so if I look at those types of folks, uh, I notice those things. Also, another thing that I notice is they, they are, they have trained themselves or are predisposed. And I think it's a combination of both to not waste energy. And what I mean by that is, uh, I remember being to give a, a very clear example. I was in Vietnam traveling, uh, uh, 
I'd worked with Room to Read and a few other organizations to build libraries and schools in Vietnam. And my, my readers had helped with that. And I went on a trip to document it, take photos and video and so forth. And we were playing pool, uh, a group of, of my, my friends and I, and one of them was Matt Mullenweg, the CEO of Automatic. And uh, <laughs> I saw a tweet from a very well-known journalist who was like, not happy, looks like WordPress.com is really slow right now. And I talked to Matt and he's like, yeah, one of our two data centers is down. Tell him that we're working on it. And he was just like sipping a beer and playing pool at the end of the day in Vietnam. And I was like, wait a second, one of your two data centers is down. <laughs> like, Isn't that a big fucking deal? And he's just like doesn't do me any good to get all riled up. My team is working on it. Absolutely zero point in me getting remotely you know, ruffled feathers about it uh, or anxious. And he didn't say it in exactly those words. He was just like, meh, like they're working on it. That's all we can do. And then just had a sip of beer and went back to playing pool. And he was completely unfazed. I mean, completely unfazed. And I've noticed that in uh, a lot of my friends here in Silicon Valley who just have you know fortunes beyond almost anyone's imagination. Um, so those, those are a few things that come to mind right off the bat. Hmm, interesting. So we'll get into some of the, the things. Some other yeah, those guys, is. just as a side note, yep. I, I, I think that it's important to think about not just time management, which is a, it's a buzzword that is used a lot, but energy and attention management. You can have all the time in the world, but if you're distracted, preoccupied with something that's happening, for instance, if you check your email first thing Saturday morning, even though you had committed to do it on Monday morning, and then you find a bunch of problems that you can't fix until Monday morning, your weekend's gone. You're not going to have any relaxation. You're not going to have any productivity. So you have all the time in the world but you have no tension. You have no energy because you're, you're dissipating it with that preoccupation, right? So that's the type of thing that these guys would not do hmm. because they understand the value of not just the time. The time is worthless without attention and energy, but the, the attention and the energy itself. Huh. So I actually have some questions around that, but I want to go back to an earlier part of our conversation um, about you know wrestling and a coach. This is something I've asked in some form or another to a bunch of people, and I probably have asked it a dozen times because I haven't found an answer that satisfies me yet, and I don't know that I ever will uh, because it's one of those types of questions. But you know, you had this pivotal moment in your life, um, and you know, you recognized it, and I'm wondering why you think we miss those moments and what we can do if we did happen to miss them. I didn't realize what I was getting at the time. It's a very Mr. Miyagi type experience. <laughs> uh, it was only in retrospect that I realized how valuable all that was. So it's not like at the time I was like, oh, thank God I'm getting this incredible education through these horrible drills that he's making me do until I vomit in a bucket. It wasn't like that. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh my God, I am so exhausted. How am I going to do my next set of classes? Because uh, where I transferred to in New Hampshire, I went to a boarding school. We had classes from like 8 a.m. to 6 something p.m. Mandatory sports, mandatory chapel in the morning. It was brutal. So I was more preoccupied uh, or concerned with just keeping afloat and, you know, making sure my coiffed hair looked good for girls or who knows what at that point, you know, 15 years old, 16 years old. Uh, but what can you do if you missed it? I don't think it's too late. You can engineer these type of things. It's, and that's kind of the entire ethos of everything that I've done, right? The four hour work week, for our body, for our chef is that it's not too late. I mean, there are too many examples of people who start multi-million dollar companies in their 50s and 60s who have massive breakthroughs or publish their first uh, award-winning novels uh, in their 50s, 60s, 70s. It's like the idea that you can't manifest this type of outsized incredible success in multiple areas or uh, renegotiate basically the genetic limits you thought you had for muscle gain or fat loss or endurance. I mean, there's so many of my readers who have taken what I've done in, say, The 4-Hour Body and in every chapter, like Ultra Endurance or uh, The Effortless Superhuman or the uh, you know, Breath Holding, any of these, readers have, have destroyed my results which people thought were crazy when they first read them. Uh -huh. I've, I have dozens and hundreds and thousands of readers who have just demolished my results, who have 2X'd, 3X'd my results in every one of those chapters. Um, and uh, people can find, I usually star a lot of them when they come up on Twitter. So if you go to my Twitter favorites, um, at T Ferris with two R's and two S's, people can see some of them. Uh, but it's just not too late. I think it's like, look, you know, spilt milk, water under the bridge, choose your metaphor. Right. Uh, 
you know, let's, let's not, let's not obsess on the past. Let's, uh, let's focus on how you can engineer that stuff right now. And if you look at my career, keep in mind, nobody knew who the hell I was before 2007. Right. And this is, uh, you know, I was about to turn 30 and that's certainly young. Uh, but, uh, if I hadn't written that book until five, 10 years later, uh, I could have published that book at a, a much later stage, right? And would have would it have struck the chord and had that impact? I don't know, uh-huh. but uh, there are so many examples of this. You know, it's like you take someone like Garrett Camp, who had uh, you know reasonable amount of success with Stumble Upon and so on, but it wasn't until very recently, I mean, in the last few years, that Uber, which he co-founded, turned into what it is now, right? And uh, and there are people who'd say like, oh yeah, what he did at stumble upon wasn't a huge success or what he did in between wasn't a huge success or whatever it is, all the naysayers and the people who, uh, who nip at everyone's heels. Uh, and, uh, you know, somebody said to me once, you know, statues aren't erected to critics. And I think that that's, <laughs> it's a great thing to keep in mind. Um, so the, the upshot of that is it's not too late. Focus on how to engineer those things because there are recipes that work and uh, just model world-class performers who exemplify the characteristics that you have. And ideally model people who not only have the success in a given field that you want, but also who have holistically the life that you want, because you can find people with hundreds of millions of dollars who yell at their kids, whose wives or husbands hate them, uh, who do a lot of drugs on the weekend or on the evenings just to live with themselves. And, uh, you need to, t- you need to keep in mind what the total picture is. Like, do, do I think Steve Jobs was an amazing creator, uh, on, on many levels, uh, a visionary, uh, product guy as well as CEO? Absolutely. Of course. Do I think he was a happy guy? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> do I think that he was a, ple- do, do, was he a pleasure to be around? Uh, no, he was not definitively. Uh, so it, it's good to look at it holistically and not just piecemeal. I mean, there are things you can borrow uh-huh. from someone like a Steve Jobs, of course, uh, namely things like, and this is another one that, that, that groups these types of ultra performers together. Uh, he said something along the lines, you know, to do anything great, you have to say no to a thousand small things. Mm-hmm. And I'm paraphrasing that, but that is also, uh, um, the uh, and Warren Buffett has said what separates the, the people who are good from those who are great or the people who get good results and those people who get great results is the people who get great results say no to almost everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be that'd be another observation that I've made over time repeatedly. You know, so w- one other thing you brought up earlier was that wrestling gave you an individualized style of competition. And, you know, the reason I'm interested in, in how we find that in our own lives is because I think it's very easy, especially on the Internet, to get caught up in comparison and, and competition with every single person that is out there. You know, I mean, I can look at you and think, well, I didn't accomplish what Tim did. And, you know, I've had a lot of awesome things happen in the last couple of weeks. And then the other thing I'm interested in talking about is this idea of competition compensating, uh, you know, or capitalizing on your strengths and compensating for your weaknesses and how you figure out how to do that in your own life. Does that make sense? It does. The last part is perhaps a little easier to answer. I think the, (laughs) the, the comparison, the, the desire and impulse to compare yourself to others is, is a, it's a, it's a, it's an element of being a human being. I don't, I don't think it, it's very hard to eradicate that completely. I think, uh-huh. um, but what you can do is realize as is very popularly said here in Silicon Valley, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with physically, emotionally, financially, and so on. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So you need to try to choose that inner circle very carefully and look at uh, the people you're spending time with. So for instance, and this doesn't mean you have to move to Silicon Valley and know the people I know, you could join a local uh, EO chapter, Entrepreneurs Organization chapter, for instance. And within that group in any in any given city, you will find ballers. You will find just killers who are, who are doing amazing jobs. And if you have dinner with such a person, you sit down and talk about certain problems you're facing, you will probably have your mind blown at, at their perspective or how they look at the problem. And, uh, that has always just been a game changer for me. When I look at these guys and I have dinner with them and it's like my petty problems seem so (laughs) trivial and ridiculous. They're, They're the types of things that wouldn't even consume a millisecond of Matt Mullenweg's time. For instance, you just be like, well, whatever, drop it. 
and then on to the next thing. Like as, as opposed to like obsessing on like, you know what I should have said to that guy when he sent me that rude email? Fuck that guy. I should have done this. And it's like this internal conversation in my head for four nights. Right. What a waste of energy, right? And then you spend time with, with some of these guys or somebody that you seek out and find at say an EO chapter or elsewhere. And you realize, wow, that was just the most egregious waste of energy imaginable. And you start to model this person. You look at them as a role model and you start to ask yourself, for instance, um, and I've done this before. I mean, it sounds funny, kind of weird and creepy. Hopefully, uh, Matt isn't listening to this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I interviewed Matt on the podcast. He's a very good buddy of mine. Uh, but sometimes when I'm about to get angry and I catch myself because I'm very aggressive, very impatient, kind of prone to uh, just barreling down and going on the offense, uh, which has helped me in a lot of ways, but it's not always a help. Uh, I will ask myself, what would Matt do? <laughs> like in this situation, what would Matt do? Um, so, uh, that has been a very, very helpful pattern interrupt that I use in lieu of spending a ton of time with, with someone like Matt every day, which is not going to happen mm-hmm. necessarily because we're always traveling and so on. But I can knowing him as well as I do. And you could get that even from a book. Like if you read about Ben Franklin or Steve jobs, like what would Ben Franklin do? Uh, but for me, it's what would Matt Mullenweg do? Because I'm trying to absorb through osmosis the calmness that he has. And uh, I do the same thing with a lot of my friends, Kevin Rose and other people. They all have characteristics that I, I, that I want to develop myself. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, You probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. So let me ask you this. I mean, when you first, you know, started pitching the four hour work week, I know you got rejected by, you know, what is it? It's like 27 or 29 publishers. I don't remember the exact. Yeah, I've yeah, lost count between okay. somewhere between 26 and 27 publishers. Yeah. So uh, my question is actually around managing your own psychology through this, you know, process of the entrepreneurial journey. Um, and I'm interested in a couple of different things here. One is, do you think that grit is something that certain people just inherently have built into them? Or is it something we can cultivate? And if so, how? And in your own sort of journey to to getting to where you're at, have you ever had any really sort of rock bottom or dark moments where you just felt like you could see no hope for your future? Uh, Okay, so grit. Uh, Grit or stick-to-itiveness, I'm guessing, is, is how we could define that. Uh, I would imagine there's a genetic component. There's a genetic component to just about everything, but uh, it is also a uh, it is also a coachable and learnable skill. I think or attribute. Uh, and uh, you know, one of one of Matt Mullenweg, not to make this the, the Matt Mullenweg <laughs> show, but one of one of the things that he said to me long ago uh, when I was I asked him, well, is it this or is it this? And he said that's a false dichotomy. And that's a fancy way of saying it doesn't have to be either or. Uh, so whenever somebody offers me like, well, you can do A or B, like I'm like, could we do both? What is option C? Uh, and you know, Henry Ford would say, you know, when you think you've uh, when you've looked at all of the options, just remember uh, you haven't. <laughs> and uh, so <clears throat> I would say that that grit can be developed by. Uh, sequentially, or I shouldn't say sequentially, progressively exposing yourself to discomfort in different ways. And that makes you more comfortable with plowing through pain or temporary embarrassment and things like that, which is why there are these comfort challenges in the four hour work week, which people resonated incredibly with, got a great response from it. It's like every chapter, it's like, look, I'm telling you what to do, but you're not going to do it unless you have some certain level of comfort with discomfort. So here's an exercise to make you very uncomfortable. You know, 
go to Starbucks and lay down on the floor for 10 seconds without telling anyone why you're doing it and then just get back up. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to cause any harm. No one's going to, you know, and it's, it's, it's like there's no real harm to be had there, but it will make you very uncomfortable. <laughs> and um, they seem silly, but those things transfer. Those things transfer very, very well. Mm-hmm. So, so, so grit is really a matter of practice and exposure. Have I had rock bottom moments? Oh yeah, I've had tons. I've had plenty of rock bottom moments. And a lot of the males in my extended family have predisposition to depression. So I've had uh, extended bouts of depression and feeling like there was no hope and there were no options and I was stuck. I was in a corner, no options at all, et cetera. And I've, uh, you know, I've written about that in, in one post called uh, productivity hacks or productivity tricks for the neurotic, manic, depressive, and crazy, and then in parentheses, like me. So if you look for productivity hacks or tricks for neurotic in my name, uh-huh. <laughs> the post will pop right up. And I talk about how I talk about one of my particularly difficult depressive periods and how that affected my behavior and my, uh, my, my, my self perception and insecurities and so on. Uh, the, it's been said by, for instance, Customato, who's a, who was the trainer of Mike Tyson at his heyday, that you know the, the, the hero and the coward feel the same thing. It's how the hero responds that is different. And I, I, I think that everyone, <clears throat> unless you're a mutant, uh, but most people I have met, including, I mean, household names you would know that you that are have sort of ho- superhero status. Uh-huh. Uh, have these days. They have days where it's like they hit snooze for an hour or two on a weekend because they don't want to get up because they have these neurotic and worried thoughts in their head and they just do not want to face the day. I mean, this is, this is not uncommon. It is part of the human condition. So I think that, um, uh, my general coping mechanism, there are a couple of them and I, I elaborate on them in the, in the blog post quite a bit, but exercise is kind of the cure all for a bio, for a lot of biochemical reasons, for a lot of structural reasons, meaning creating something in your day as a peg upon which to hang everything else. If you're trying to get back on your feet, I find that that exercise, which could just be a long walk. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm, a, I think walking is very underrated. I try to walk an hour or two a day, uh, which has, I'm not doing for any, f- any fitness purpose. It is, uh, we've, we've made a lot of evolutionary trade-offs to be able to walk and perambulate the distances that we can cover as human beings. It's true. Like we've made a ton of sacrifices to be able to do that with the nuchal ligament and everything in the back of our head, which prevents our heads from wobbling like a pig when we walk. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so those are those are uh, a few of my thoughts on those two questions. Do you think these depressive tendencies are just a part of sort of a hero's journey if you're going to do anything of great significance? Like you have to go through a tough time? Yeah, I th- like it's a rite of passage I, almost? I, I think so. Uh, I mean, if you're going to do anything extraordinary, uh, by definition, it is extraordinary. You will be unaccustomed <laughs> to experiencing the stresses that go along with that. And the stresses can be internal. They can be external. They can be you stress, EU, like euphoria, good stress that builds you up and helps you grow like lifting weights. Um, you can experience that in a business capacity or it can be distress, which is tearing you down. And oftentimes it's a combination of both depending on how you, how you look at that stress, your perspective and your, your the lens through which you look at it. But uh, the, uh, yeah, I've been doing some screenwriting and this is just a, a hobby recently. And it's like, he, I have, I have the, the writer's journey right next to me, which is talking about Joseph Campbell and how that fits into movies like star Wars and so forth. The all is lost moment is pretty real. I got to tell you. And what was, what was funny about well, funny in retrospect, not when it was happening, filming the Tim Ferriss experiment where you were, you know, I'm tackling these crazy skills every week, like, you know, professional poker. All right. It's uh-huh. like, I, I know nothing. And then I'm going to play against professionals for thousands of dollars in like four days or learning a language well enough in you know three or four days to go on live TV and for six minutes in that language, just crazy, crazy stuff is, uh, it became almost a running joke for my crew that like every, uh, every, 
second day of filming, the night of every second day, I would basically have a nervous breakdown. And, <laughs> and I suppose I never, I never thought of it this way, but you could probably take the hero's journey and map it right onto every single episode uh-huh. and watch me just like crash and burn and self doubt and like self loathing. Um, Almost every time at like the, <laughs> the end of the second day or depending on the skill, like the middle of the middle to end of the third day. So I, I think that it is part of it. And that's why it's 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 helpful to get into the practice of uh, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt who recommended this. But every day doing something that you fear, uh-huh. like every day, do one thing, whatever it is, you know, approaching a cute girl and just saying hi could be that simple. Laying down in Starbucks, you know, <laughs> ma- having that uncomfortable conversation you've been putting off, uh, calling maybe a parent that you haven't that you've grown a little distant from and saying, I love you, something really vulnerable like that. I mean, it could be any of these things, but like every day do one thing that makes you nervous, makes you fearful. And, uh, you know, on top of that, you know, I would also put in that uh, basket of rituals that I find very helpful. You know, reach out to someone and express gratitude. Uh, you know, say thank you to someone uh-huh. that you haven't said thank you to in a long time or ever, right? It could be a, a childhood friend. It could be someone you went to college with you haven't talked to in 10 years. It could be a coworker you see every day, whatever it is. If you do those two things every day, man, I, I really feel like t- those tiny micro changes uh, cumulatively can just produce monsters in the best way possible, like monsters of productivity and just breakout successes. It's, it's the little things that we do repeatedly that make us. Very, very cool. Um, so, you know, I, I, it will, this will lead us into talking about the TV show, but one of the big questions that has been on my mind is I, I knew I was going to talk to you. I was trying to think, I'm like, how do we get an angle on this? But you know, you have so many interests and different projects that you work on. And something that I was really curious about is how you choose what you're going to work on and how do you, you know, like, how do you decide that, Hey, this is what I'm going to do next. Cause it seems like anything is an option at this point. With great difficulty. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I read a book recently, uh, several chapters of which I thought were fantastically good, called Who? And it is a book about hiring. And it's written by, or at least co authored by, the son of the author of a book called Top Grading, which is considered by a lot of CEOs to be the book on hiring. But those who've read both say that who is more direct, more actionable. And that book takes the perspective, which is uh, maybe a contrast to, say, Simon Sinek, who says, start with why, right? Start with why, then you figure out the how and so on. Uh, But these guys start with who, which uh, you pick the people you want to work with, and that dictates the projects that you choose. Now, I don't 100% fall in either of those camps, but I do think that the latter is very interesting to ponder because I so strongly believe that you are the average of the five people you associate with most. So it's like, all right, well, what if I picked the people I wanted to work with and that dictated my projects? Even if I did that for a six-month period of time, what would happen? And uh, I have been trying to do that more and more. And I have, uh, keeping in mind, and it's taken me a long time to realize this, but a good deal with a bad person is a bad deal. Does that make sense? Contracts don't protect you against anything, uh, Uh, really. I mean, it gives you the right to sue someone later, perhaps, but contracts are only as good as the people who sign them. And so if you think you've got, oh my God, I'm going to make millions of dollars from this deal. It's great. Like, yeah, this guy's kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah, he's like, sometimes goes back on his word, blah, blah, blah. But this contract is amazing. We've negotiated it. It's going to be beautiful. It's not going to be beautiful. I can almost (laughs) guarantee you that that deal is going to sour as soon as the paperwork is signed. And to that end, uh, there are people I've really, really enjoyed working with over time or just enjoy hanging out with. And, uh, that's how I've ended up advising a lot of the companies that I advise for that matter, you know, as I'm really close friends with say Garrett camp. And so I become an advisor to stumble upon stumble upon doesn't quite work out as everyone might hope, but then Uber happens and I end up being an advisor to Uber. Well, thank God for that, you know? Uh, and, uh, it's just been uh, a revelation for me to realize that 
much earlier than you would think. You don't have to wait until you're making millions of dollars to make this decision. Uh, you can choose who you want to work with <laughs> in a lot of ways. There's, uh-huh. there's actually a lot of latitude for people to do that. Uh, even if you feel like you have no leverage and you're a new hire at your first job. And this is why one of the core skills you have to learn is how to communicate well and negotiate. So go get books like Getting Past No or The Secrets of Power Negotiating by Dawson and practice role play. Go to a farmer's market on the weekends and use that as your comfort <laughs> exercise to haggle for things. And don't be a total dick. Actually buy something. Don't just haggle everybody. Right. It's like a total bastard move. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is uh, – yeah, that's how that's how I frame these things. It's it's interesting because I, I I may be subconsciously doing that without even realizing it. Like I I've realized that almost every project I have chosen to do that I uh, you know really enjoyed doing has always involved some sort of creative person or an artist. In the last two years, I'm like, if I don't get to work with somebody like that, then I'm like, why are we doing this? If it's just you know mechanics and marketing, I'm bored to death. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, the, the, I mean, we could talk about all uh, different aspects of this, but, um, how people choose projects. Uh, I also am choosing projects with certain minimal thresholds. So if there is a financial component and there are sometimes financial components, it's like, well, if you say yes to everything that is kind of cool, Uh you will not have the bandwidth to do the hell yes, amazing game changing things. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And uh, I heard of a demo that was done in a classroom at one point that, that, was, that really stuck with me. And I think I read about this, where a professor took a mason jar, you know, one of these, these uh, large-ish mm-hmm. uh, uh, glass containers, and he said, all right, watch this. I have, you know, a cup of sand, a cup of smaller rocks, and then I have two big rocks. And he put in the sand, then put in the mixed rocks, and then he couldn't fit even one of the large rocks in. And then he said, but what if we do this a different way? And then he took another mason jar, put the two big rocks in, then the smaller rocks, and then the sand, and everything fit. And he's like, you have to choose the big things first, or you won't be able to fit them in later. And uh, that is very difficult to do, uh, particularly when you have a degree of, say, public exposure and a lot of inbound offers. Like, I'm very fortunate in a way, but also cursed to have a <laughs> lot of kind of cool things that come across my plate every day. And for a very long period of time, um, this was probably last year, mm-hmm. I was drowning in kind of cool things where I was like a six out of 10 excited. And I'd made all these commitments, and I was actually pretty unhappy. I was, I was drowning in these things that I wasn't totally lit up by, but that were kind of cool. And I didn't have the bandwidth to do, uh, I had to miss and say no to one or two things that were absolutely what I would have wanted to take up all of my time because I had too many preexisting commitments. And, um, I've, I've made a concerted effort to reorganize, uh, organize my life to avoid that type of problem. But it's, it's very challenging. You have to, you have to get comfortable saying no to almost everyone and recognizing that there's no one path to success, but the path to failure is certainly trying to make everyone happy. Uh, and, uh, in a digital world where everyone expects an immediate response, <laughs> right. people are, people are going to get hurt feelings and yeah. you have to establish a meditative practice or some type of preparation for your day that will allow you to accept that and not try to put a bandaid on everyone by making commitments. Mm-hmm. And Marcus Aurelius, I'm a huge stoic a philosophy fan and proponent. And uh, I read Stoic philosophy all the time because I think it's a great operating system for high stress environments. But, you know, Marcus Aurelius in meditations, one of his letters, and I'm, I'm going to uh, probably massacre this because I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like, you know, today you will be faced by ungrateful people who are petty, who have, uh, you know, trivial vendettas, who are going to be obnoxious and rude and otherwise make your life difficult. He's like basically just preparing for that so that he's mentally prepared and isn't blindsided, doesn't react uh, in a uh, non-conscious way Uh uh, that compromises him. Does that make sense? He's like, look, this is going to happen. So let me prepare for it in advance mentally so that I make the right, I have the, I have the correct response. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so I establish policies. For instance, I have a policy where if any startup 
tries to rush me into a decision by applying false time constraints, I'm out. Uh, because that's bad fucking behavior as far as I'm concerned. So if they're like, hey, you know, we've never talked before, but so-and-so said I should email, and we're doing this, and our round is closing in 48 hours, you know, are you in? Minimum is this amount of money. And I'm just like, sorry, I can't make a decision that quickly. Right. What is your leeway? And they're like, no, man, we're closing right now. We've already, we're already overcommitted. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, then peace. Good luck. I'll see if I can, I can cheer from the sidelines. But I do not. And I borrowed that from another investor who was very, very successful. And that's one of his policies. It's like, if you try to rush me unreasonably, you're out. I don't care how good the deal is. I don't mm-hmm. care how awesome you are. If you try to apply that kind of false time constraint, I'm out. And just having that rule gets rid of 30% of the pitches, 40% of the pitches that I get. It's very easy. Um, you know, Other rules I might have are if, if someone sends me a deal, and they're like, hey, man, wanted to introduce you to the CEO or introduce you to this deal. It's like, you know, is, and I'm borrowing all of these. I didn't make any of these up. It's like, is this one of the, t- the top three entrepreneurs that you would back and are you investing in this deal? If the answer is no to either one of those, then I'll pass, right? Uh-huh. And just by doing that, which is really hard to do consistently because people are like, oh my God, like, but that guy invested in my other deal. I feel badly, so I'm going to invest. And, uh, you know, you might have to do some of that political, like social capital work, but if you do it all the time, you get bad returns. And I've had really crazy returns in the startup world. I mean, people can check out all my deals at uh, AngelList, angel.co forward slash Tim. You can see you know, 30, 40 deals that I've done. Mm-hmm. And it's not because I'm an idiot savant when it comes, or just a savant, when it comes to angel investing. It's that I, I've borrowed these rules. And so those are the recipes that I try to find no matter what I'm doing. And then you can get these crazy, re- you can get these crazy returns, whether it's learning language or, uh, you know, learning drumming or, or startup investing, uh, without Warren Buffett like predisposition. Cause the guy's like a robot. I don't know how right. he does what he does. Um, so that's, uh, that's how, that's, that, that's how I think about it. Huh. Well, let's do this. I mean, we're getting close to about an hour here and I haven't really given you a chance to talk about the TV show, but I, I wanted to go into one specific thing that you learned just because I being an avid surfer, that was the one that I picked. I was like, let's talk about that whole experience. And, uh, you know, you talked about each show being a hero's journey of sorts and the surfing one happened to be my favorite one. Cause I remember when somebody told me, I said, I'm like, how's that going to work? As a surfer, I know one thing, the variables are never the same. Like it's always inconsistent. So I'm really interested in what that whole experience was like for you. Surfing was tough. (laughs) Surfing was really tough. Uh, Not surprising. Um, Like you said, because it's not, it's not, you're not just learning how to balance on a board. You're not just learning how to pop up. You're not just learning how to ride once you are up, but you have to learn, like you said, to navigate and try to predict a constantly changing environment and terrain. Uh-huh. And so it's, it's completely unlike something like snowboarding, for instance. Right. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's also completely unlike snowboarding in the sense that there are, uh, there are many more physical attributes that are, that are developed over time for surfing specifically, you know, I had Laird Hamilton helping me, which was pretty awesome. Uh-huh. That guy's just a beast <laughs> yeah. for, for those people who don't know. He's considered the uh, undisputed king of big wave surfing for very good reasons. I mean, he's been on the cover of surfing magazine just with the title. Oh my God is the headline. Yeah. Uh, and he's 50, 51. And the guy is a better athlete than almost every 20 something professional athlete I've ever met. The guy is just a monster. And, and uh, he's, one of the things he said to me is, you know, they should really call surfing paddling because that is 99% of the time that you're going to spend on the water. And the best paddlers are almost always the best surfers. So he was not only deconstructing all of that, but figuring out, all right, if you're unfamiliar with the water, um, much more so if you're afraid of the water, like, <laughs> I, like I have been my whole life and particularly drowning, what is the sequence that you use to try to establish a basic vocabulary that you can use on the water? Um, and uh, it, was, it was a really terrifying, embarrassing, but ultimately, um, it's, I mean, I, I don't overuse this word, but like life-changing experience. And after that, this was not chronicled, although I have some, I have some pictures. Uh, I went to Costa Rica with a friend of mine with a couple of uh, surfing coaches mm-hmm. and like surfed on my own in Costa Rica in waves that were, uh, yeah, these, these are not 30 foot waves, but they <laughs> right. were for, for me, I mean, over my head, which is huge for me. Yeah. And it, uh, it was, it was a really awesome experience. And what made it the most, the, the biggest takeaway for me was 
removing my own excuses, killing my own excuses, because uh, I talk to friends, doesn't matter what age they are. If they're 27, they're like, yeah, man, you know, once you once you pass 25, oh man, my joints hurt. And then you talk to somebody who's 30, they're like, yeah, man, I just turned 30, you know, and like it's all downhill. And then you talk to somebody who's 35, 40, they all have that same excuse. Like, oh, well, you know, and then I'm hanging out with Laird Hamilton, <laughs> who's in his 50s and he will crush any fool. Like, yeah. all right, oh, you're the you know first round draft pick from the NFL. Yeah, come to my gym. He'll crush, like he's, just a um, beast. And on, but I was like, all right, well, that's layered, right? And I think people do the same thing with me sometimes. They're like, oh, right. well, it's Tim Ferriss. So I'm like, oh, well, it's layered. So of course I couldn't do that. And then I meet uh, <laughs> a bunch of, uh, or uh, Titus, who's one of the, uh, the Hawaiian elders, the, he, he, an amazing surfer who we interacted with. And I looked at a photo on his wall, surfing like a, I mean, it, to me, it looked like a 50 foot wave. And in Hawaii, they measure the, they, they measure they the face the of the wave. Yeah. They, yeah. They measure from the back, not the face. So it's, a, it's like, yeah, it's 20 foot wave. And then somebody visiting from California goes out and just almost dies because it's actually 40 feet tall. Right. And uh, so Titus, there's this picture on his garage wall riding this just behemoth of a wave. I mean, one of the biggest things I've ever seen. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, it was my 50th birthday and I wanted to take a commemorative photo. So he went out and surfed. I was like, oh my God, you know, all right. All my excuses are complete bullshit. Like I just have to, I just have to (laughs) euthanize all of them one in a head, just like, you know, one at a time, just take them all out behind the garage and shoot them in the head. Cause it's, they're such BS, such total BS. So I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm hoping to help people do the same thing where it's like, Come on. If you're putting someone on a pedestal, it's not because they deserve to be on the pedestal. It's because you don't want to take the responsibility for the fact that the excuse you're giving is total BS. Um, And yeah, I've just seen too many outliers, Mm -hmm. too many seemingly freaks of nature do things that it turns out you can replicate with with the right recipe, the right crib sheet. So uh, surfing was a great experience. And I also had one day, (laughs) this was in Kauai, and I was out on the water. And, uh, I was sitting out there on the water with, with one of the other coaches and, uh, Kamale, uh, Alexander, I think his last name is, who's amazing. And, uh, there was like a sea turtle, like went by my feet and then there was a double rainbow and then we saw a whale and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, <laughs> this is like one of those sort of cheesy, uh, murals that you see on the wall with like the wave and the dolphin and the the otter underwater and the rainbow and i was like yeah right i mean maybe on a t-shirt that you'd buy at like fisherman's wharf but that that stuff doesn't happen and then it all happened at once in Kauai, and i was like all right you know what even if i am a terrible surfer i get why people surf <laughs> well, do you know what i mean oh. even if you're a terrible technical surfer I totally understand why they come out whenever possible to do this. Oh, I I mean, I've been doing it for about seven years now. And I mean, the minute you stand up for the first time, that's it. Your life is divided into two distinct moments before and after surfing. Yeah. And I think that's true with a lot of skills, right? I mean, having learned to swim in my Mm -hmm. thirties, it's before and after like there is before swimming and after swimming. And the, the, the scope of things that seem possible to me is infinitely larger as a result. And I think that's true with, with a lot, with a lot of skills. Um, and that was true for me, you know, tenfold over, uh, with all the experiments. Wow. Well, Tim, I know you got to get going here. It seems like we could go talk for another hour easily about all the things that you have going on. Uh, so I want to wrap with my final question, uh, which is how we close all our interviews here at the unmistakable creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Something that makes someone unmistakable is being different and not just better. And part of doing that is knowing thyself and being true to yourself. Be be that weird person, which is yourself. You are not normal. No one is normal. No such thing. And embrace the things that make you unique, even if you might view them as weaknesses, like me, like my impatience, for instance. I've harnessed, I've harnessed that and channeled it into specific categories of activities where that is rewarded to the extent possible. And it's not always a help, but you know, take that and use it. And if you think you're quirky and weird, guess what? I bet there are 10,000 people out there who love exactly that type of quirkiness and weirdness. And that is what I've done in my books. That is what I've done 
on the podcast. And the challenge is with pressure from people outside who might say, do this because you'll hit a bigger market. Do this because it'll appeal to these people is sticking to your guns and being consistent. Uh, and if you are just yourself and have that consistency, it will set you apart. Mm. Well, Tim, uh, this has been really, really eye-opening and uh, insightful, and I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share some of your insights and uh, your story and parts of your journey that we haven't heard before uh, with our listeners. Yeah, totally my pleasure, man. And I, uh, I would encourage people, I fought for a year to get the rights to, to make these resurrected, but the, um, the TV show, I'm putting out all 13 episodes at once. They're the, the most incredible teachers you've ever seen. And it, it basically delivers a playbook for becoming a world-class performer uh, that anyone can use. And it's um, Tim Ferriss Experiment. So on iTunes, you can find it, itunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss with two R's, two S's. And then if you want extras and extended scenes, conversations with uh, Laird and Titus that didn't make it into the show, for instance, then you can go and find that at fourhourworkweek.com forward slash TV. Cool. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.